So I know when I graduated, I graduated in the winter of 2017, December of 2017. And I was just like, man, I can't wait. I'm bringing my program to a close. I'm like, ooh, we. <laughs> and I also took a break to kind of recoup and get my mind right for the next phase of my life. But when I finally kind of got my bearings in order, I'm like, dang, what's next? I spent the majority of my senior year or even like that last semester of my master's program just really trying to hit the ground running and making sure that everything was, was in order so that I can graduate. But when I sat down and I realized, dang, I really, really, really need to be pursuing all the things that I have hoped and dreamed for as a, as a future clinician in this field, I was just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> where do I begin? Where do I start? So that's what I really want to do with this video. I want to make sure that we're creating a checklist to help prepare for us to become a future clinician. So whether you graduated in the winter like me or you're watching this in your spring semester or summer semester it doesn't matter I hope that you're able <laughs> to take whatever tidbits you need to help you kind of guide into the next phase of your life but before we jump right in I need you to hit that subscription button below that way you can stay up to date with newly released content on a regular basis so let's dive right in <laughs> First things first, you need to go to your Secretary of State's website and look under the Licensing State Board's section and then you need to also find out the licensing requirements of your particular state. And the reason why that's super important and why I said your particular state is because every state is different. For example, in the state of Georgia, the state board requires a thousand hours per year over a three year span. That, that totals up to about 3,000 hours. Also, on top of that, they require 35 hours per year for clinical supervision alone, right? <laughs> You're probably like, wait, what? Oh my gosh, yes. On top of the 3,000 hours, you have to have 35 hours a year for clinical supervision. And in comparison to the state of Florida, I know the state of Florida only requires 1,500 psychotherapy hours in total. And then they also only require 100 clinical supervision hours as well. They also take different courses too. So make sure when you find that packet from your licensing board, you literally comb through everything, everything from top to bottom. And it'll teach you how to submit your paperwork. It'll teach you what you need to get, whether it's a letter of recommendation or anything like that, um, what coursework you need to submit as well. It's just a lot. <laughs> so make sure that you're finding the appropriate packet or the appropriate licensing protocol for your state so that you can go ahead and get that done, okay? The second thing that you need to be mindful of is testing. And I know y'all are probably watching this and like, dang, I literally just finished my comps. I thought I was done with this testing thing. Nah, bruh. <laughs> that's not the case for those who are watching this who are probably not even in their second year of their program or are kind of trying to figure out whether or not the counseling program is for you the comps that I'm referring to is a test known as the counseling preparation comprehensive exam or comprehension exam whichever one so towards the end of your program in order to graduate from most clinical mental health counseling programs or counseling programs in general you have to take this test to kind of show the program or show the board that hey i know what the heck i've been doing i'm not just breezing through my courses i actually learned something when it comes to testing after your program it's super important that you figure out what tests that your state needs some states require the NCE which is the National Counselors Examination and other states require the NCM CHC, which is the <laughs> National Clinical Mental Health Counseling Examination. Child, I hope I used the right letters just then. <laughs> that is just like an alphabet soup. My bad, y'all. <laughs> I'm just like, ah. I didn't have to take the um M N M. -N I did not have to take the N C M H C E exam. So that's why the letters are kind of like iffy for me because <laughs> I didn't have to take it. In the state of Georgia, they only require the N C E in order to pursue licensure. And that's exactly what I took. Essentially, the number one thing that you need to do is create a plan of study in order to pass the test 
For me, I felt like the CPCE prepared me for the NCE, and that's just me. But other people were saying that the NCE was pretty much harder than the CPCE. It all depends on who you are and how you test or whatever. Also, too, no test is the same. It changes, and it's based on the state a national average, not state. It's ba based on a national average. So. You'll never get the same test. However, the questions are pretty much around the same thing. The question themes are around the same thing. So one great resource that I used when I was testing, I used Rosenthal, which was super, 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 super great and amazing from top to bottom. And it's an easy read as well from, from what I gather. And a lot of people say that about Rosenthal's study guide as well. It's an easy read, you can hear his tone. He's a, just a great and amazing teacher. So I'll send you guys a link in the description box below. That way you can also go to the link and purchase it if need be. And if it's too expensive for you, consider looking for flashcards that are out there. Um, there are a lot of free resources too. A lot of programs or a lot of good programs. They'll create a list or a study guide of things that you can study. Um, and like I said, it's just as comparable as the CPCE or to your comps. So whatever materials that you use to study for your comps, consider using that as well. The reason why this test is super important is because when you pass it, it allows you to become a board certified, national certified counselor, which is super amazing, okay? You get more letters at the end of your name, <laughs> number one. And two, it helps promote your resume as well. The, the more letters that you have on the end of your name, it clearly means that you have more certifications, you're qualified to be able to practice in certain aspects or in certain ways. And just like constantly feed yourself, keep growing. School does not end when you graduate. You must continue to learn. I think that's the, also the reason why we're required to do continual education units as well. And that's something that I'll talk about in a different video or just later on maybe but always feed yourself and always grow so know that in order to get those extra credentials at the end of your name make sure that you're constantly studying constantly learning constantly growing and like i said that information that you acquired from your program you definitely need to hold on to it in order to pass these tests the third most important thing that you need to be doing is finding you a j o b yes a job <laughs> The reason why it's super important for you to find a job is one, you need to be paying your bills and also these student loans that we just racked up, okay? Like a master's degree, <laughs> it is quite spency, y'all. Like I saw this meme the other day that was like, oh, I'm halfway in between getting my master's and then also in between saying, dang, school is a scam. Like for real, but school is not a scam. If you wanna get your master's, go ahead and do it. I, I definitely, definitely, definitely think you should go ahead and do it but I know I, I referenced it as finding a job but you definitely need to find something that's going to help you build that foundation for the trajectory of your career and this is super super important because I know as a recent grad most of the time it's slim pickings we really don't have much to choose from because one they're not trying to hire us because we don't have the experience quote unquote and two we're just pretty much new in the game but try your very 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 best to navigate through those job postings to see what will help you gain those skills that you need in order to become that clinician that you envisioned yourself to be this is very very key and very very crucial for me I started my job hunt super early before I graduated. My program director, she was just very, very adamant about, hey, make sure that you're applying for your for for your jobs as early as possible. Let them know that you are graduating. Let them know what kind of experience that you gained through your internship and your practicum. Let all that you've done and all the work that you have put forth and effort into shine on your resume and your cover letter. That way. It's like, hey, I know I haven't graduated yet, but here's what I have. And a lot of them, they really honor that and they really appreciate the initiative and it shows that you really are pursuing something um, that you're passionate about. But I have to be honest, this job hunt thing really isn't what's cracked up to be, okay? It can be very difficult to be quite honest. So if you find yourself being that person who submitted a hundred resumes to all these applications consider you know scaling your expectations back a little bit 
and kind of dumb down and get a position as like an assessor or a mental health tech mission or even working in the ER as maybe something in social services <clears throat> anything that's going to help you get your foot in the door that way you can start collecting those hours that you need in order to submit for your licensure process I know I know I know when you graduate you're like oh my gosh the world is my oyster <laughs> I can do this thing I got it here, here I am jobs here I come yes 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 but nah bruh it, it's difficult it really is difficult and you're competing against so many other people who may have more 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 experience than you but it's all good because what god has for you is for you so if you're watching this stay stay the course definitely stay the course you'll eventually get that position that's going to help you in the long run now after you secure that job that you need yes mm -hmm, and you start making some coin and a little little bank in your pocket please find you a clinical supervisor and not just any clinical supervisor somebody who's going to walk with you along this journey okay i think a clinical supervisor is kind of like a guardian angel or <laughs> that counseling fairy godmother who's going to help you walk through your patients or walk through whatever clients that you have and whatever cases that are on your plate they will give you such insight and breathe life into you and and encourage you every step of the way so don't just get a clinical supervisor off of price get somebody that's going to literally help you become the clinician that you really really want to become if you're interested in dbt find a clinical supervisor who specializes in dbt if you're interested in child play therapy find somebody who specializes or is certified in that thing make sure that you are aligning yourself with an expert it is so key and very very crucial because a lot of times, like I said, you know, as a recent grad, we're like, dang, <laughs> I, I got more things to pay for. Like clinical supervision is really, it can be expensive, but it's all about investing in yourself and making sure that you are dedicating not only your time, but whatever financial resources that you have to make sure that you're becoming the clinician that you had envisioned yourself for. And the reason why I keep using the phrase, the clinician that you envisioned yourself for, is because I know oftentimes when we're in that program, they, they kind of hype you up. I'm not going to lie. The program kind of gasses you up. And it's just like, oh my gosh, make sure you're trauma informed. Make sure you're super ethical and this, that, and the third. And you start kind of getting a better understanding of your therapeutic identity, who you want to work with, what you want to do. And so don't let those dreams die. Make sure that you are constantly chasing that ideal self, okay? Make sure you're constantly chasing your ideal self and, and mark how close you're getting to that person that you want to become. For those who can't afford getting an outside clinical supervisor, check and see if your job provides on-site supervision, which is such a plus. It really is because not only does it kind of help you save on coinage a little bit, but at least you are working with somebody who's familiar with the population that you work with is also familiar with the work setting that you're in as well like for me my clinical supervisor works in private practice and i currently work at an inpatient hospital that also provides php and iop so i mean she has an extensive history of working in inpatient and whatnot but sometimes i have to kind of catch her up and let her know about the culture within my work setting a little bit because it's just two different dynamics another thing that i highly suggest that you do when you're working with the clinical supervisor who's on site is kind of check out their roles and responsibilities outside of clinical supervision because oftentimes i found that a clinical supervisor is also a clinical director at that particular setting and this is super important because you do not want to find yourself dealing with somebody with a dual relationship like you report to them as your boss but you also report to them as your supervisor which for some that's not an issue that's not a problem at least you're not repeating yourself twice you're working with somebody who's familiar with the case and then also too you have the opportunity for them to work with you not only in supervision but outside of it to help you kind of create a solution for your problem however that can become very sticky because even though what you say in supervision is supposed to be confidential at the end of the day 
their loyalty lies to the company. For me, I don't ever want to feel like I have to restrict myself when I'm doing clinical supervision. Like, if I'm talking to an on-site clinical supervisor, do you have your director's hat on? <laughs> or do you have your clinical supervisor hat on? Like, what lens are you operating in right now? Are you going to take what I say and take it back to my department lead are you gonna are you genuinely helping me or are you just trying to make sure you're covering your butt with the information that I provide you so that's something that you definitely need to consider when you're working with an on-site supervisor I always find it helpful to make sure that you get somebody who's outside of your organization that way it can be unbiased and non-judgmental and you don't ever have to worry about whether or not your confidentiality will be breached but if you're still trying to save them coins which i don't blame y'all okay trust and believe because i tried it too if you are definitely still trying to save those coins check to see if you're able to do an outside supervisor and an on-site supervisor at the same time some organizations allow it um but i know not all organizations do it there are some cl clinical supervisors who are like no i need to make sure that you're only listening to me or, and it's not out of selfishness, it's because they're trying to protect their license as well. And if there's ever a situation where you end up being unethical, the board brings both of their names up and tries to figure out who told this particular clinician to do this. So be mindful of that. If you do end up having both, make sure that both of them are aware of the fact that you're seeing two different supervisors. Now that you've done all of that, it's time to submit your application for your Associate Professional Counselor's license. Like I said, when I say that particular credential and that particular licensure, I'm speaking from the state of Georgia. There's other states who have different names for it, but basically your junior license. Make sure that you are doing all of those things so that you can go ahead and submit for that junior license. And the reason why that is important is because there are so many great benefits to having your associate professional counselor license. One, it shows your prospective employers, if you're still in the application phase, that you are committed to this thing and that you are operating underneath the ethical guidelines and the requirements of your state. Meaning that you are now responsible and liable for everything that you do. And it creates this cushion for future employers to know that, hey, you know how we operate in this field, and so I'm gonna hold you accountable for what you do, and you should automatically know better. Trust and believe, y'all. When, <laughs> when I say as soon as I got my license, I was protecting that thing like never before. Every time there was an ethical issue within my organization or something that just came across my desk, I'm like, I'm not signing that. I'm not doing this. Uh, can I get a little bit more detail, please? Because <laughs> I just got this thing, and I'm not letting it go. When you finally get it, you get this cute little, like it looks like a, not a coupon but you get like a cute little little license thing that you can hang up or you could carry with you and you also have a number that you can put on your resume or on your website if you happen to have one or if your psychology today profile whatever the case may be it lets people know that you are legit honey yes okay ow and people can look you up to make sure that you're in the system and that you're operating underneath a license that is valid so Make sure that you're submitting that paperwork in that application before you submit it, comb through it. Make sure that you have filled in every single aspect of that file. Consult with your clinical supervisor. Talk to your um, state licensing board to make sure that you don't miss out on everything because a lot of those applications require a fee. Y'all, when I say getting your associate professional counselor's license is just so amazing, it's like... You know you're the bomb.com when you graduated from your master's program. I mean, like you literally dedicated two years of your life to this thing. But once you get that little piece of paper, it's just like, oh, yes, all of your hard work is not in vain. And for me, I know I pursue my APC because I want to stand out with my resume. You don't have to get it. A lot of people tend to just kind of like 
wait to submit for full LPC or full um, NCMHC. But I do know a lot of private practice facilities as well as some state facilities, they require them to have APC. I do want to highlight another benefit to your APC, which I know a lot of y'all will love, okay? Because we're all about coinage, right? We're all about getting that money and securing that bag. Your APC or having that um, extra credential for your particular state behind your name gives you an opportunity to negotiate for higher pay. Like, I was making a certain amount when I first got my job. But then when I got that APC and I submitted that paper, I slid it over via email to HR and my supervisor approved it. Boy, <laughs> that pay, honey. Oh my gosh, I think I got like an extra three or four dollars. Like my, my pay jumped high, all right, to the mother freaking sky. All right, and I was, I was super excited. So if anything, get your APC and, and additional credentials so that you can be making that money, y'all. Yes, 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 yes. You worked hard, now it's time for you to get compensated for it, all right? Bam. Last but not least, get involved. Oh my goodness, please get involved and stay involved. And the reason why I definitely push this particular step is because I think it's so crucial and pivotal to the growth and development of yourself as a clinician. I know as an adult it's super hard to make friends already and then when you step into your cohort as a clinical mental health counseling student you tend to create friends, you tend to create bonds and all of those things but as per usual, when you graduate, sometimes you end up going your separate ways. You guys find different jobs, you're on different work schedules, things of that nature. And I can speak to this now because my little crew that I hung out with when I was in school, like we're all kind of doing our own thing and we're still trying to learn how to meet up a little bit. And we're still growing as professionals within the settings that we're now working in. But life doesn't end with your program your social life should not end so that's why i say it's super important kind of figure out what's going on in your city what are some events that you can go to to network not just networking events because networking events can be a little boring i, I must admit they can be a little boring so try to find groups where you're not only consulting or talking to other clinicians about the settings that they work in getting a better understanding of what they specialize in because you never know like with talking talking to people you get an understanding of what they do how they do it why they do it and maybe that may be something that you want to add to your future repertoire as well uh, rather than going to pay for the CEU and figuring out hey this is not what I want to do <laughs> it gives you an opportunity to gain more experience by listening to their stories I've met so many great clinicians who probably have like 15 20 years of experience who are literally doing therapy with their eyes closed <laughs> or, or they have experience in private practice or they have experience in working in a hospital setting or have experience working in the community all of those things I felt like I grew as a clinician by living vicariously through them and hearing more about what they did with on a day-to-day -day basis start scanning the web for all those different opportunities for you to build your clinical community whether it's through Facebook groups I have, I'm a part of so many Facebook groups whether it's like clinicians of color within private practice because eventually I want to go into private practice um, I also have like therapy for black girls um, black therapist rock those things I know y'all probably like all these black 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 yes I'm sorry <laughs> as a clinician of color I need to have support from fellow clinicians so shout out to all my white followers I got y'all but I'm just letting y'all know what works for me also find things that are for your niche too the circle I love my clinical supervisor because she's the facilitator of the circle I talked about it before with my interview with her I'll tag y'all in it she runs a group where we literally just sit down and have topics on a weekly basis just talking about the ins and outs of being a clinician not only in the city of Atlanta but
but the populations that we serve and how we can grow not only within the therapeutic world but also from a business perspective from a private practice perspective from an entrepreneurial perspective so find those things that are going to constantly feed you and grow you and develop you as the clinician that you are intentionally trying to become another thing too not just social groups please y'all register for these conferences join these organizations there's the american counseling association there's the um licensed professional counselors association of georgia or whatever one that's happening is happening in your state or make sure that you're finding things for school counselors for social workers for whatever whatever is your vibe whatever is your niche make sure that you are registering for that thing that's a, a national opportunity for you to meet other clinicians from different states different regions different countries like i've been to every aca since my senior year so i went to the one in san francisco i went to the one that's here in atlanta and now i'm on my way to the one that's going to new orleans that's happening in 2019 and i've severely benefited from it a hundred percent i've met some great and amazing clinicians and i've also was able to connect with a lot of speakers and gain more information also the great thing about conferences are most of them allow you to get ceus so remember what i was saying was just like your state requires a number of things like whether it's a number of hours a number of clinical supervision and also a number of CEUs I believe for the state of Georgia is 32 hours every two years don't quote me on that I just know I got to get these hours <laughs> and I'm practically almost done because with one ACA conference alone I was able to get like 12.5 or even 13 um CEUs and that to me was just amazing it's definitely worth it i know some of them can be expensive but as a recent graduate the cool thing is you will get a discount for being a new professional or if you join the organization before you graduated you pretty much still have that membership as a student and so you can register for that conference as a student and collect the CEUs for it there you go right <laughs> And, and if you can't do a national conference, check out local conferences too. It happens all the time. Like I said, in order for you to build your community, you really have to step out, introduce yourself, figure out what's going on in your state, in your city, in your neighborhood. That way you can definitely grow your network and become the clinician that you are called to be. <laughs> I know that was a lot of information thrown at you, but it's all well and good. The great thing about video is that you can always rewind, press pause, you know, jot down some notes, watch it later, whatever the case may be, do what you have to do. I know graduating has been the best thing in your life and you're on cloud nine and you're currently on a high right now, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you after a couple weeks, it's time for you to get your butt up and get to work. It doesn't stop. It does not stop. The grind does not stop. So get in gear and make sure that you're doing these things so that you are setting the course for your career as a mental health clinician. Thank y'all for rocking with me. I'm still trying to get used to these braces. You know, they tearing up my mouth a little bit. I, I had to take the wax out because I didn't want y'all to be talking about me. <laughs> Please, 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 please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. And hit that comment section below. Let me know where you're watching from, what state you're from, and I will send you the link to your um, licensure board. That way you can start, you know, moving and grooving and doing what you have to do. You'll have no excuses. No excuses. So get your butt in gear, all right? Before I forget, y'all, hey, 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 Legacy Squad, we have merch. So head over to the website and check out all the things that are available this comes in cardinal red like the one that i'm wearing right now as well as gold and heather navy so head over to legacyspks.com cop your sweatshirt as well as your official legacy speaks t-shirt oh oh while supplies last thank you so much for tuning in to another episode like i said and you can definitely stay connected via legacy spks on everything until next time